I'm very excited to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Yuhuru Williams. Dr. Yuhuru Williams is Distinguished University Chair and Professor of History and Founding Director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. Williams received his PhD from Howard University in 1998. Dr. Williams is the author of Black Politics, White Power, Civil Rights, Black Power, and Black Panthers in New Haven, Rethinking the Black Freedom Movement, and Teaching Beyond the Textbook, Six Investigative Strategies. And he is the editor of A Constant Struggle, African American History from 1865 to the Present, Documents and Essays. Dr. Williams has appeared on a variety of local and national radio and television programs, most notably ABC, CNN, MSNBC, Al Jazeera America, BET, C-SPAN, Fox Business News, HuffPost Live, and NPR. And he was featured in the Ken Burns PBS documentary, Jackie Robinson, the Stanley Nelson PBS documentary, The Black Panthers, and the History Channel miniseries, The Titans That Built America. Dr. Williams was also one of the hosts of the History Channel's web show, Sound Smart, and he is a contributor to the Progressive Online. Dr. Williams' scholarly articles have appeared in the American Bar Association's Insights on Law and Society, the Organization of American Historians Magazine of History, The Black Scholar, the Journal of Black Studies, Pennsylvania History, Delaware History, the Journal of Civil and Human Rights, and the Black History Bulletin. Dr. Williams is presently finishing a new book entitled In the Shadow of the Whipping Post, Lynching, Capital Punishment, and Jim Crow Justice in Delaware, 1865 to 1965, under contract with Cambridge University Press. And I have to say, I've known Dr. Williams for most of my life, and I can say that we are all in for a real treat today. Dr. Williams visited Reed School several times while I've been principal here. He was a keynote speaker for our eighth grade graduation several years ago, and he's spoken to our seventh and eighth graders several times over the years. And trust me when I say, you could hear a pin drop. He would have a long line of seventh and eighth graders at the end of each presentation wanting to get close to him to ask him questions. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for your time with us today. Thank you, Principal Smith, uh, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, can everybody hear me? Just going to make sure. And I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to um, begin this morning first by thanking um, Principal Smith and the committee for the invitation. And my topic today will be the other CRT, the importance of culturally responsive teaching in an age, in a moment of mass disruption. And I want to be clear, Secretary Cardona spoke to it. Certainly, I don't need to tell anyone who's on this call today that we are in a moment of mass disruption in the United States. We're in a moment of mass disruption globally, whether we're talking about COVID-19, whether we're talking about this national, in fact, global reckoning with racial injustice, whether we're talking about gender equity um, and, and gender inequality, we are in a very important moment in our history and now more than ever educators have a critical role to play in helping young people understand what it means to be uh, part and parcel of a much larger conversation about participatory democracy as it regards or as it relates to the United States. Having said that, I wanna begin with the words of James Baldwin who wrote, the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. I don't hope in the 45 minutes that I have with you today uh, to change the way that you're thinking about this moment. What I hope to do though, is alter the way that we're thinking about the opportunities that present themselves for us in this upcoming year. As we talk about um, helping young people uh, understand the importance of racial justice and social justice and how we think about reimagining the educational enterprise around the same. Having said that, I wanna talk about the shadow of this moment in the context of the other CRT, the one that everyone is talking about and that's critical race theory. 
um, in this misnomer, this falsehood that's being perpetuated that somehow in K-12 education, when educators are privileging multicultural education, when we're talking about inclusiveness, inclusiveness, when we were talking about diversity, somehow we're teaching critical race theory. And I wanna just put this out there uh, to begin with. There's gonna be a great uh, panel later with Nitsa and Steven, and they will talk about the controversy over critical race theory. And they're gonna talk about uh, in a much more deeper way, uh, some of the contours of that debate. Where, what I wanna say with you today, and I just wanna put this out there is that, uh, very few educators are talking about critical race theory in the way that um, is being framed by some people in this country. Uh, that political debate is false. At the same time, it's important to recognize that culturally responsive teaching and critical race theory echo. And I'll talk about those echoes in just a second. Um, part of the problem here is that this has been politicized in a way that people who know very little about the origins of critical race theory have tried to tie this to the culture war and to make this a simple conversation about justice, which bottoms on the kind of lazy misrepresentation of the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Two great political cartoons from last year. One shows uh, supposedly a professor teaching about critical race theory framework, talking about the research, so on and so forth. And a young person comes up and says, sir, didn't Martin Luther King Jr. say that it all came down to simple equality? Yes, but the problem is it's not that simple. In fact, we have to talk about this in the context of the larger culture war. And I love the cartoon on the right, where um, two years ago, 2017, excuse me, we were in the middle of this conversation about Confederate war monuments and this idea of the erasure of history, this idea that was being perpetuated that somehow um, history was under assault. It continues in, the, uh, in, our, in our present moment around this idea that somehow critical race theory seeks to erase the founding fathers, seeks to um, teach all the negative aspects of American um, history without celebrating uh, the more positive aspects. And we'll talk about that as well um, in our conversation today. But look, I would be remiss, and I'm going to offer you a trigger warning. I can't uh, you know, talk about any of this today without, in some sense, being political. And by political, I simply mean what Harold Laswell wrote in 1958 when he offered a very simple definition of politics. Politics decides who gets what, when, and how. And so what we choose to focus on, what we choose to talk about, or what we privilege in our conversation is an extension of politics. Right now, for those of us that teach in diverse school districts, for those of us in communities like Philadelphia, like Bridgeport, like Hartford, like Meriden, like Minneapolis, St. Paul, where I am, conversations about culturally responsive teaching matter now more than ever, given the shadow of this moment. What is the shadow of this moment? It's not just the murder of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Ahmed Aubrey. It's not just what we witnessed over the four years that President Trump was in office. And I'm not being partisan by saying this, but it is a matter of fact that in that period, we had this push for a rollback against immigration and um, it's terrible conversation at the national level, irresponsible conversation, mischaracterization of Latino. Uh, African-American and other racial minorities in this country. And we also have to talk about this in the context of January 6th, where you had a mob march on the US Capitol, the temple of democracy as one legislator put it, in an effort to not only delegitimize de an election, but to make the case that somehow um, their rights were being trampled upon. And what they brought to the US Capitol in that moment were the symbols of a history that we don't teach. A symbol of a history that really illustrates the erasure on the other side. And that's the invisibility of people of color in the history, um, in the curriculum that we share with young people. And that's part of the problem, part of the reimagination that, that this committee hopes to inspire today is around thinking critically about how we utilize in this moment an opportunity to reimagine, to re-energize, and to be more responsive to the communities we serve. Now, that doesn't mean at its core that we're losing. It actually means that we're gaining and, and, and deepening and creating some depth around what we talk about in the classroom, whether it's in social studies or in mathematics or in language, and I'll talk about all those um, as we progress. But I, I wanted to spend some time here because 
people get destabilized when we use certain language. For example, white supremacy. People lose. Well, why are we talking about white supremacy? I don't. The symbols that were bought to the U.S. Capitol have a history. When you present a news and you talk about it divorced from the history of lynching in this country, by default, you do a disservice to what that symbol means. When you produce a Confederate flag and you pretend that it's simply a symbol of Southern heritage without talking about the history that it reflects, you do a disservice. When you do this in a way, as we talk about the shadow of this moment, that doesn't, in some sense, require you to think through what Thurgood Marshall proposed in 1958, um, just a few years after Brown versus Board of Education, that at the core, the uh, individuals who are entrusted with the duty of helping young people or stewarding young people through this are educators. See, Thurgood Marshall said in September of 1958, let's be clear because this is the importance of January 6th. This is the importance of George Floyd. This is the importance of the response to the pandemic. This is the importance of culturally responsive teaching. Education is not, nor has it ever been, about the teaching of the three R's. Education, Marshall wrote, is the teaching of overall citizenship. To learn to live together with fellow citizens and above all, to learn to obey the law. He continued, I do not know of any more horrible destruction of the principle of citizenship than to tell young children in Little Rock. Of course, he's writing this not only in the aftermath of Brown versus Board of Education, but he's writing about this in the uh, wake of the massive resistance to the implementation of Brown versus Board of Education in Southern states, where you have Southern governors like Jay Lindsey Allman closing Virginia public schools rather than see them opened on an integrated basis. You see really the stirrings of a second civil war. You have the federal government pitted against um, the, the 11 states of the former Confederacy are making the case that in the immortal words of George Wallace, we're gonna fight for segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And in that moment, here is Thurgood Marshall saying, educators have an important role. Don't lose me here, because Marshall continues. I do not know of any more horrible destruction of the principle of citizenship than to tell young children in Little Rock, those of you who withdrew, rather than go to school with Black kids, come back, all is forgiven, you win. Therefore, I'm not worried about the Black children in these states. I worry about the white children in Little Rock who were told as young people that the way to get your rights is to violate the law and defy the lawful authorities. I'm worried about their future. Listen closely. I don't worry about the Black kids' future. I don't worry about the Hmong kids' future. I don't worry about the Latino kids' uh, future. I don't worry about the Puerto Rican kids' future. I don't worry about the Cuban kids' future. I don't worry about, insert here, they've been struggling with democracy long enough. They know about it. Part of what Thurgood Marshall is calling us to reflect on that is so important in our contemporary moment is that this isn't simply a question of inclusiveness for the sake of inclusiveness. This is fundamentally a question about American democracy about living up to the principles that are articulated in the founding documents, which we haven't lived up to. And as people talk about this collapse or what they perceive as a collapse of American democracy, not connecting the dots that at the core, the only way for our democracy to ultimately continue to grow, to evolve, is to make real those promises. And I want to be clear that when we talk about this in the shadow of, of Little Rock in 1957, uh, Secretary Cardona spoke to it when he talked about the Maasai tribe. The question is, what impact did it have on the children? Because I would submit to you today that like in 1957, I'm going to read to you from the diary of Melba Patilla Beals, the youngest of the Little Rock Nine, who is on the front lines of what happened in uh, Little Rock as she's attempting to go to Central High. And one day, uh, the governor calls out the State Guard to prevent them to go to school. And the next day, the President of the United States calls out the National Guard to ensure that they can go to school or nationalizes the state guard. And here's Melba in the middle of this. And I think of Melba in some sense in the same way that I think about our young people today and how they're looking at what's taking place across the country. What does Melba write in her diary? How strange I thought to be involved in something that the whole nation considers among its 10 most important stories. If it's that important, you think somebody would do something to make the Central High students 
behave themselves? Is it that nobody cares or nobody knows what to do? You can almost hear in Melba Patil, Patil Beals from 1957, but the echoes of today, she continues. By New Year's Eve, I only thought about Central High perhaps every other hour. So on New Year's Eve, 1958, I sat home completing my list of New Year's resolutions. Number one, to do my best to stay alive till May 29th. In that moment, Melba Patilla Beals' fear is over potentially being harmed because she's part of the advanced guard of, it, of, of uh, desegregating schools in Little Rock. But I wonder how many of our students, particularly those of us that teach in urban inner city areas, have that same fear for other reasons. COVID-19, uh, violence, drugs, and the indifference that they must feel when the national conversation doesn't pivot around how to address those concerns, but actually is pushing for an exclusion to the detriment of the essence of who they are. Don't lose me here because Melba continues to pray daily for the strength not to fight back, to keep faith and understand more of how Gandhi behaved when his life was really hard, to behave in a way that pleases mother and grandma, to maintain the best attitude I can at school, to help grandma India with her work, to help Minnie Jean remain in school and be a better friend to her. What I love about this is that there was a co-curriculum that Daisy Bates, the head of the uh, Little Rock NAACP, actually provided for these young people when they knew they were gonna be going on into uh, the schools and being part of that advanced guard. They had to understand nonviolent direct action protests. So they read Gandhi. They had to understand the principles of not fighting back. So they were steeped in um, the philosophy of Gandhi and they were reading about um, and, and trying to learn about the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King. I share that with you because in a way, this was a culturally relevant curriculum to them to help them face the unique challenges that those nine children would face at Central High that year. And if we can make the case and see it historically, then ultimately we can also think about it in the context of how young people must have felt about the response of the government in that moment, where you have the president of the United States, Dwight David Eisenhower saying, and I quote, a foundation of our American way of life is our national respect for law. In the South as elsewhere, citizens are keenly aware of the tremendous disservice that's being done to the people of Arkansas and the eyes of the nation, and that has been done to the nation in the eyes of the world. Our enemies are gloating over this incident and using it everywhere to misrepresent our whole nation. We're portrayed as a violator of those standards of the conduct which the people of the world united to proclaim in the Charter of the United Nations. So Eisenhower is saying this, and yet young people are listening to Eisenhower and saying, the one thing that you didn't mention in the speech, Mr. President, the one thing you didn't talk about were the nine black children. You're worried about what the Soviet Union says in the propaganda. You're worried about what the eyes of the world are saying about us, but you're not worrying about us. That the young people who are at the center of this controversy in 1957 are invisible. And it's that invisibility in some sense that should force us to, to deal with this issue that Thurgood Marshall is talking about when he talks about struggling with democracy long enough. Because when he says that, when we think about students of color, and I'm gonna talk about African-Americans specifically here for just a moment. When we talk about struggling with democracy long enough, it's not just the police brutality, the racism that's captured on cell phone cameras. That's the, the problem. That's the tip of the iceberg. It is a history of racial inequality, racial um, exclusion that we don't talk about that ultimately has contributed to this reckoning, this moment that we have now. It is our failure to address, for example, uh, you know, as a lifelong Connecticut resident, this assumption that somehow just because there is a Confederate war monument in downtown New Haven that has a Confederate, that that should stand for all time because we don't uh, do the work of understanding as David Blight did in his book, Race Reunion and Civil War. Those monuments came up is part of a culture war at the turn of the century by organizations like the Daughters of the Confederacy who were trying to ensure that even though they lost the war, they would win the peace by making the case that, that uh, the South had fought honorably for what was a morally bankrupt cause. And when we couple that with conversations about redlining, when we couple that with conversations about 
um, exclusion of voting, unfair labor practices, what I call the six degrees of segregation, housing, education, denial of access to places of public accommodation, unfair labor practices, Jim Crow justice, the most intractable of those six degrees of segregation. We think about it in that context. This is not the teaching of critical race theory. This for our young people is simply a recognition of their reality. Look, we can look at it from the perspective of Thurgood Marshall, or we can look at it from a, a different perspective, from the perspective of John Smosh, a legal scholar who argues that American nationhood rests upon a common faith and a civil theology, largely composed of the principles of the Declaration of Independence, the preamble to the Constitution, and elaborated rights of the individuals found in the Constitution and its Bill of Rights. But I want to be clear that what he's saying here is that, again, these are the principles, but why don't we talk about those, those, those values being contained in like Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution? Because it's really in the preamble, which is this aspirational language about what we aspire to be. That is the basis for that civil theology. In order to get there, then the principles of critical thinking, interrogating the past, being in a space where we can ask the difficult, hard questions about our history in a way that enable young people to see themselves as agents of change are ultimately what help um, our democracy grow. Don't lose me here because, again, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to demonstrate it. So let's look at the core democratic values for elementary students as put out by the National Council for the Social Studies. National Council for the Social Studies says these are core democratic values that every elementary student should know. What are they right? Well, number one, life. Each citizen has a right to the protection of their life. But see, for our young people, the, 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 the tension there is that life and meaning uh, the protection of life, safe schools, safe environments, or is that stand your ground laws? in Florida. Each of these is contested. And I also want to point out that where are they taking that language from? The aspirational language of the Declaration of Independence. Take a look at the next one. The pursuit of happiness. Each citizen has the right to find happiness in their own way, as long as they do not infringe on the rights of others. Liberty includes the freedom to believe what you want, freedom to choose your own friends, justice. All people should be treated fairly. Popular sovereignty. The power of government comes from the people. Truth. The government and citizens should not lie. In some sense, as we think about this moment, young people looking at these core democratic values for elementary students have to be feeling the same way that Melba Patilla Beals much, must have felt in 1957 and may not be as generous as Melba was in that moment in judging those in a position to do something about it. One of the people who comments on this in a roundabout way is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And after Jimmy Lee Jackson was murdered in 1965, the events that will ultimately lead to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Martin Luther King delivers a eulogy for Jimmy Lee Jackson where he lays blame on what has produced the situation in the society in that moment around racial justice that need to be addressed. I want to share this with you because what King uh, says in that moment is a state trooper pointed the gun which killed Jimmy Lee Jackson, but that state trooper, he argues, did not act alone. Jimmy Lee Jackson was murdered by the brutality of every sheriff who practices lawlessness in the name of the law. He was murdered by the irresponsibility of every politician from governors on down who's fed his constituents the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. He was murdered by the timidity of a federal government that can spend millions of dollars a day to keep troops in South Vietnam and cannot protect the rights of its own citizens seeking the right to vote. He was murdered by the indifference of every white minister of the gospel who remained silent behind the safe security of his stained glass windows. And he was murdered by the cowardice of every black person who passively accepts the evils of segregation and stands on the sidelines for justice. The one group that King didn't comment on in that meditation, which I think is pretty comprehensive, is education. And one of the reasons that I commend the work that Cass is doing now is this is the heavy lift which is necessary in this moment to think in a very concrete way about how we privilege diversity and how we focus on these issues. And I share this with you again, it was read to you earlier, but this is critical. Education must continue evolving to remain relevant to and reflective of students' social, cultural, and linguistic backgrounds to assist in the development of their lifelong respect and compassion for themselves, their classmates, their communities, and the world around them. That's core democratic values. I can't translate it 
in any more concrete terms. When uh, people say to me, I'm scared to go into the classroom in September because I'm afraid that what I need to put into my curriculum to really help young people make sense of this moment might get me into trouble. I say, put the preamble on your word wall. And as you're walking through with your students through the semester and you interrogate language like we the people, what did that mean in 1789? How did it mean something different in 1865 and in 1919, 1920? How does it mean something very different today? That's not a deviation from the curriculum. That's a deepening of the dialogue about what it means to be a citizen, what it has meant and what it can mean. Providing an opportunity for young people to, as they're thinking about their own future, reimagine not just the past, but the work to be done in the present and in the future. Don't lose me here because I think this is important when we think about this also as an extension of what employers are asking for. So a lot of times when people go, oh, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned about what's happened in the case. There's all this conversation about career readiness. Um, I'm taking this from masterclass. And this, these are the critical thinking skills that they say are necessary for uh, people who are moving into business. These are the th same things that we, uh, that we emphasize as educators. Critical thinking, open-mindedness, analysis, interpretation, problem solving, decision making, effective communication, self-improvement. And these kind of, of, of uh, critical thinking skills are really at this moment, if we think about what's happening in corporate America, also part of this reckoning with the issues of racial justice. This isn't critical race theory, this is critical thinking. If you're gonna have an unbiased thought process and remain open to more than one point of view, then you have to have multiple point of views, which means that we can't continue to promote the same narrative and assume that that narrative somehow has orthodoxy because it's been there longer than all others. We have to be open to challenging information in the ways that we're thinking. We have to analyze information differently, look at different streams of data we have to interpret, take the time to think about that, um, be problem solvers, think about decision-making based on that, that it, those, th those inputs so on and so forth. When we think about it in this context, then not only is this not a deviation away from, it's an invitation for young people to see themselves as part of the enterprise of the evolution of what is the United States. That's a civics lesson at its core. You know, sometimes I had a debate a couple of months ago with the gentleman who said, this is undermining young people's respect for history and undermining young people's respect for democracy. I disagree. What it's doing is not um, uh, undermining it. It's in no way doing that. What it's doing is inviting young people to deal with what uh, J.D. Crow depicted in this political cartoon as the whitewashed elephant in the classroom. Because race has been central to so much of our history, because gender has been central to so much of our history because immigration has been central to so much of our history. And if young people can't see themselves reflected in that history, how are we ever gonna hope for them to see themselves in any field as contributors when they're excluded deliberately in the way that we talk about those advances? Look. I want to be clear that when I say that what's killing American democracy is not confronting that history, it goes back to the statement that Cass has put out. We want our students to graduate as responsible, well-rounded, and productive citizens who are ready to engage with others and thrive in our interconnected, diverse global society. Our students are best served when empowered with tools to understand and investigate the countless lived experiences that exist in the world around them. They can't do that if they've never been exposed to multiple perspectives, if they've never had an opportunity to study with an educator who says, I'm in Bridgeport, Connecticut, so rather than teaching progressivism through the lens of battling Bob LaFollette from Wisconsin, I wanna talk about the people whom your schools and our streets are named after, that we have parks like P.T. Barnum named after. I wanna tell you that P.T. Barnum wasn't a perfect individual. In fact, I wanna decenter him a little bit and say that, you know, P.T. Barnum came back to Connecticut and ran for the uh, uh, legislature from Fairfield because he wrote in his one of his three autobiographies that he wanted the privilege of voting in favor of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. That, that, does that make him a hero? Does that make him an anti-racist? 
makes him complicated, but it deepens the story in a way that allows young people to understand we've been struggling with these issues for a very long time. And who ultimately influenced P.T. Barnum? Well, there's a great story behind that that I don't have time to share with you today, but I'll simply say that when you're open to reimagining the way that we're thinking about teaching, it can be reflective of so much more than the narratives that we've all be become accustomed to. And I wanna be clear that this isn't really about how to be an anti-racist. This isn't really about white fragility. What this is at, a, at its core is about equipping young people to be ready to live and to work and to be productive members of an ever increasing interconnected global world. It is putting them in a position to be able to um, elevate their voices and they're doing so because what we need to do, and I apologize that the images aren't being displayed here, but what we need them to be able to do is to make sure their experiences are visible and that their voices are heard. I'm gonna say this to you at the, at the risk of losing you, but I'll be clear. Melba Patilla Beals was in some sense writing, committing to her diary, what it felt like in 1957 to be unheard, to be at the center of a controversy and for no one to be listening or invested in you. Ask ourselves the question, what happens when people are not seen and not heard? And I'm gonna have to stop this share for a second and see if I can uh, get this up so we can actually see some of this stuff, excuse me. Okay, so the question is, what happens when young people are not seen um, and not heard? And I, I want to tell you that what ends George up happening Floyd. is you get what Al Sharpton articulated last year at, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. And I want to share this with you. And again, Al Sharpton can be destabilizing and polarizing to some people, but I want you to listen to him from the standpoint of this idea of what it means when you don't talk about that history in a way, when you don't engage that history in a way that leaves young people wondering in a way that Melba Patil, Patilla Bills was left, left to wonder, where am I in this equation? Where do I fit in this equation? Let me start from the beginning here. George Floyd's story has been the story of black folks because ever since 401 years ago, the reason we could never be who we wanted and dream to be in is you kept your knee on our neck. We were smarter than the underfunded schools you put us in, but you had your knee on our neck. We could run corporations and not hustle in the street but you had your knee on our neck. We had creative skills. We could do whatever anybody else could do, but we couldn't get your knee off our neck. What happened to Floyd happens every day in this country in education in health services and in every area of American life. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. Now, I wanna be clear with you that that was just last June that Al Sharpton shared that. And again, no matter what you think about Al Sharpton and whatever your, your kind of take on him and his politics um, are, the reality is that he's speaking to an un, unstated reality for a large segment of people of color in this country that transcends his experience. And we could talk about an experience of people who might be more palatable to, to many people. Let's take Congressman John Lewis who passed away last year. Congressman John Lewis is born in 1940 in a world in which segregation is the norm. He kind of reaches his pinnacle of success or notability or notoriety, at least as people know him today in 1965, where he spills blood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, in order to push through um, or to get even the conversation going on what would ultimately become the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He dies in 2020 in the midst of a national Black Lives Matter movement. There's a way in which young people can walk away from this timeline and say nothing has changed. 
where there's a way that they can walk away with from this timeline if we become stewards of that conversation to say everything is possible because we can see within this this blueprint opportunity for evolution for growth it's important to recognize that because in some sense where we wind up is in a broader conversation about racial justice about social justice that requires us to be uncomfortable as secretary cardona uh, put it being or sorry excuse me to be comfortable as secretary cardona put it being uncomfortable and that's difficult for some people because ultimately uh, they come to the conclusion that uh, I don't want to stretch. I don't want to have to grow. I don't want to have to change what I teach. I don't want to have to uh, be put in a position where I'm asked uh, to translate for young people the meaning of these moments, these episodes. But the reality is that young people aren't asking us. They're doing this themselves without us. And they're asking us to do so, do it with them in concert in a way that at the core, puts us in a position to deal with this history that we become ultimately co-creators with them and what can be the new reality for everyone. What am I talking about? I wanna go back with you for just a second. I'm actually gonna skip Frederick Douglass here to what I shared with you earlier about those six degrees of segregation. And I wanna share with you a very disturbing political cartoon from the 1880s. And I think about this in the context of the wave of anti-Asian violence that occurred in the United States. It's been occurring in the United States um, over the last year, but certainly since uh, the onset of the coronavirus pan uh, pandemic. And we all know the sources of where that came from. In this cartoon, Thomas Nast depicts uh, Asian immigrant, Chinese immigrant being lynched by a group of Americans. It's a very disturbing cartoon, again, from 1880. And what the caption reads is, we don't want any cheap labor foreigners intruding upon us. But the cartoon is interesting because it depicts as the mob, Irish, German, Italian, and African-American. Now we know that African-Americans did not participate in lynchings like this. But what Thomas Nass was trying to say is that these very groups who themselves have been discriminated against to so easily be influenced to adopt and embrace discriminatory behavior that's the problem. And if we look at it in that context, the thing that's great about that is here's another very disturbing political cartoon from the 1880s, 1879, also Thomas Nass, and it depicts a Native American speaking to an indigenous person, speaking to a Chinese immigrant, and he's reading about the Chinese exclusion problem. And if you look at on the right, what's written there, it says the Chinese problem, prohibit Chinese immigration. And as you scroll down, it says laws providing for their banishments, foreigners not wanted. Patent Irish, lager beer government must um, have social order, no nothing of ism of the past, down with the Irish, down with the Dutch, so on and so forth. So it's that history of anti immigration, but it's tied intimately to race. And in the back, you can see an African American gentleman sitting on what appears to be a wall, and over his head is written the words, My day is a coming. Of course, this cartoon is 1879. Less than 20 years later, you'll get the Supreme Court's ruling in Plessy versus Ferguson making separate but equal the law of the land for the United States. If this is critical race theory by simply saying that in order to understand our contemporary moment, we should look to the past for illumination around what those young people were talking about in that video, that social justice matters, that it permeates our society, that our awareness about this puts us in the best position to not only um, survive, but deepen the foundations of our government, maybe reimagine, um, get rid of that which no longer serves us, like Confederate war ma monuments and erect what does, uh, monuments to equity and justice, a history we can be proud of. Don't lose me here. Because I want to conclude with you today by talking about something that just happened a few months ago, and that was the dismantling of George Floyd Square. And, and I asked that question of what happens when people don't see themselves or can't see themselves. Well, not too soon after the verdict was rendered in the um, case of Officer Derek Chauvin, uh, city officials in Minneapolis came in and got rid of George Floyd Square, reopened it back up. And my fear in that moment, as I shared with the local reporter, was that this was one of those celebratory moments, like what happened after the uh, passage of the 
um, at the end of the Civil War, what happened after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that people assume that we got a verdict and so we have justice so we can walk away. That's it, you have no responsibility. And yet I would argue in those moments, the reason we have so many unfinished revolutions in our history is because people walk away prematurely before the work is done and educators are always at the advance guard of that work. Don't lose me here, but I wanna play this for you. Um, I'm talking about the police in this clip, but I'm also talking to and about educators and I'll conclude shortly after this and take some questions. When Minneapolis Police Chief Madeira Arredondo took the stand on Monday, his testimony seemed to have more than the jurors in mind. It felt like he was speaking directly to the people of this community and trying to emphasize what the core values of the department are. As a professor of history, Dr. Yahuru Williams says the chief's testimony condemning the actions of a former officer is significant. But so too, he says, is the explanation of the critical decision-making model that the chief says guides all officers. I thought the wheel as a graphic was really really interesting in showing this kind of range of activity that officers are supposed to engage in as they're encountering the public. If they don't treat that community member with respect or give them voice, it's likely that uh, they will receive less information that will be less helpful. He has to convince the community that um, even though you saw a massive departure from that protocol on what happened last May, this is the protocol, and we have to be able to trust that police officers are going to encounter the public by abiding by that protocol. But it's a fragile trust. And Dr. Williams says that fragile trust in the justice system was on display in court last week. We see it both in Charles McMillan and in Donald Williams, this idea that as a person of color, particularly an African-American male, one has to be very cautious in the way that they address authority figures, not to invite um, the stereotype of the angry black man or to provoke uh, this kind of resistance that comes when you're assertive, I'm in a man of color. We saw Charles McMillan in some sense trying to caution George Floyd um, during the incident. I was telling Mr. Floyd, Mr. Floyd, just ply with him, get on in the car because you can't win. And you see that to a certain extent, although he's assertive with Donald Williams on the stand where he is very clear, he is not angry. It's fair to say that you grew angrier and angrier. You know, I grew professional and professional. I stayed in my body. You can't pay me out to be angry. Dr. Williams says that fragile trust was also clear in the observations of a much overlooked witness, former Speedway employee, Alicia Euler. What it is you saw that caught your attention? Just the police, um, try not to cuss, <laughs> just the messing with someone. Her uh, testimony for me was very compelling because in addition to all the other challenges that people at 38th in Chicago and so many other communities experience, um, the worst of it is when the police come, as she put it, messing with people. Charles McMillan hinted at it too when he said, I met Chauvin the week before and I said to him, you know, I want you to go home safe at the end of the day and I would like to go home safe at the end of the day that for people in communities like 38th Chicago, for people who live on the so-called margins in our society, encounters with policing often don't end in that way. We saw it in that video. Um, you have people who are speaking out but not being heard. That look on Derek Chauvin's face in some sense becomes a symbol of what we mean when we say that women and people of color in our society are often not only marginalized, they're silenced. If we're all ultimately gonna live up to that aspirational um, diagram, we have to think about those elements that also contributed to this that extend beyond the violence we saw visited on George Floyd's body. When we talk about that, I wanna go back to this concept of, or, or this idea that Thurgood Marshall articulates about what the purpose of education is, because at the core, then what is the role for educators in this? I've been fond of saying in the aftermath of the uh, trial of Derek Chauvin that uh, the people here in the Twin Cities, in fact, people in the United States are the jury. What does that mean? Ultimately, we get to decide what society we want to live in post um, that verdict. And what that means for educators by default is exactly what Cass has laid out in its statement of principle regarding equity and um, equitable teaching. And at the core, that has to be this respect for culturally responsive teaching. I'll put it in the context of the Twin Cities and then I'll put it in the context of Connecticut. The reality is that we have to reimagine curriculum, not just the social studies curriculum, not just the civics curriculum, to be inclusive, to be demonstrative of the people who live in this community. And in this community, it is people from Somalia and uh, Hmong and African-American and a large indigenous population, uh, native peoples, 
um, who make up this com uh, community, but who are not reflected in any way in the curriculum. And so that big work of rewriting the curriculum is underway here. But at the same time, it goes uh, much deeper than that. And unfortunately, um, my other PowerPoint um, is not working. So I'm just gonna have to talk to you about this without showing the images of it. But what I wanna share with you is that this idea that James Banks offered so many years ago about multicultural education is not dead. In fact, it's more vital now than at any point in our history. This idea, this need for culturally responsive teaching uh, bottoms on our need as educators to uh, put the experiences of those that we teach first, to make sure they're reflected in um, the curriculum, to make sure that we are in some sense responsive to what they're experiencing so that they don't experience this cognitive dissonance that I talked about that you can see in the words of Melba Patilla Beals. My PowerPoint we're working today, I would share with you the experience of Malcolm X. If you've ever read the autobiography of Malcolm X, Malcolm speaks to this when he talks about his interactions with his teachers and the fact that he felt that he was not seen. In fact, Malcolm says he began acting out because he wasn't seen. And then later on, he tells us in another famous passage from that, that he met, went to meet with his English teacher, Mr. Ostrakowski, and he tells him he wants to be a lawyer. And Mr. Ostrakowski's response to Malcolm is for him to be reasonable and to aspire to something that would be um, uh, more appropriate for a young black man in that moment. And Malcolm ends that passage by saying, it was in that moment that I began to change inside. We have tremendous power in this moment as educators to think through culturally responsive teaching practices in a way. And I, again, apologize that I'm not gonna be able to share this with you. Um, so it's really a, a great slide. Actually, we'll try one more time. Maybe we'll get lucky. Um, Try this. Uh, I'm going to give up on that. I wish I could share this with you. I wanted to talk about the first time that I visited Reed School uh, and Principal Smith's um, school in Connecticut. And what blew me away about that is at that time, there was this conversation that was taking place in the city of Bridgeport around universal pre-K. And it was a small committee that was put together to explore wraparound services and interventions that we could imagine to really create opportunity for young people in a way that would help us to be a model for what could be a national push toward reimagining education around these wraparound services. And there was all this conversation and, and all this talk. And I went to Principal Reed, uh, I went to Principal Smith School at Reed, and I walked in. And what did I see on the walls there? I saw images of young people making representations about civil rights history. I saw evidence of multicultural education and the celebration of the individual experiences of those students. I saw examples in the science and mathematics classes of people of color and their contributions to those areas. I saw a music room, which I hadn't seen in years because of the defunding of music and arts education um, in a way that celebrated another form of expression that helps to elevate student voices. What I saw as a laboratory, a community for young people to self-actualize in a way that was affirmative of their identity, both as members of the Reed community, as members of, this, uh, uh, of the larger Bridgeport community, as citizens of the United States. I don't think that those young people will ever lose sight of the importance of that experience going forward because whatever else was happening outside the school, the school became a place, a platform for them to be able to deal with that history in a way, uh, to talk about their experiences. I, I also wanna emphasize the importance of, and again, I would do this if my PowerPoint were working, with ELL students. One of the things that I wanted to share with you was the um, infamous Supreme Court case of Lau versus Nichols from 1974, where you have um, Justice Douglas writing for the majority and saying that if you don't address the needs of English language learners, English language learners, that's basic English is a civil right, but making sure that they're also, and they don't go this far, but it's, it's certainly part of this idea. If their experiences are not reflected in the classroom, you're not giving them anything that they'd wanna learn because everything that they do in some sense privileges the way, and, and again, I think I do have this one, I will be able to share this with you uh, to conclude, privileges the problematic way that we talk about white supremacy. And I do wanna, um, I will be able to share this uh, with you. Actually, I won't be. Um, think about Resma. Uh, Manikam's My Grandmother's Hands and the way that he talks about white supremacy in that book. And he says, 
White body supremacy elevates the white body above all other bodies. The white body is ostensibly supreme standard against which other bodies of humanity are observed and ultimately judged. The reason I like that is that when I walked into Reed, not to the detriment of any other body, it was a celebration of diverse bodies. It was a celebration of inclusiveness. It was a reflection of that community. I grew up in Bridgeport with um, people from uh, Latin America with a lar its large Puerto Rican population, with its large West Indian population. I knew how important it was to understand a little bit about those uh, languages and cultures and to, in order to feel part of that community and how important being part of that community was. I have a good friend here in Minneapolis, the Twin Cities, who's involved in um, healthcare. One of the things that he's doing is literally um, kind of reimagining healthcare by going to the sites where uh, the people who are moving to the Twin Cities are coming from to study the health systems in those countries to better understand how to meet the needs of those people once they're here. Because he recognizes that if we're gonna have real impact, then we have to appreciate that history and that diversity in a way that's not inclusive for the sake of saying, we put you up for Black History Month, but inclusive in a way that we say, we're trying to fully integrate our experience to recognize that in order to be fully human, we have to embrace diversity. Again, I apologize for the um, snafus with the technology today, and I did wanna leave some time for question and answer, so we, we can go to that now. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Smith. Dr. Williams, I just want to thank you. I think that you said it best when you said that we have tremendous power in this moment as educators to think as culturally responsive teachers. And I just, um, I just can't say how engaging and how thought provoking your talk was. I've been getting messages from people left and right. So thank you so much. And we do have a few questions. Um, I'll read the first one to you, Dr. Williams. How do we deal with the shadows of the moments with students when central office tells us not to discuss them in class or not to insert our opinions as teachers or leaders? Talk of politics belongs in the classroom. We are obligated as educators to have these controversial conversations primarily because discourse is linked to achievement. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, I'll put a link in. Um, we did a PBS NewsHour Extra a couple of months ago where I talked about teaching the capital insurrection. And my argument for this is that you um, teach by proxy and you comment by proximity. And so the way that you do that is for those people who say, you know, you can't teach the capital insurrection. I'm not teaching the capital insurrection. I'm talking about Little Rock in 1957. The fact that it echoes what happened on January 6th I can't help if the students bring up those questions organically, which they will, then I can't help that. But what I'm talking about is, and again, if I am uh, creative in the way that I'm thinking about ordering my year. So our entire semester is gonna be an interrogation of core democratic values. I'm putting the preamble up. I'm starting the year by having students read John Lewis's last letter to the final letter to the American people. You know, that's how I'm kind of framing the year. So whatever we do over the course of the year that um, forces us to contend with any of that language is in no way a deviation away from what I've set out in the beginning, which is we're interrogating what it means to be an American. We're inter interrogating the evolution of our politics and culture. And in that sense, again, Viver and I, maybe all these things that I talk about in the, the webinar that you'll be able to see, make sure that you map those in a very clear way to your content standards, right? Make sure that you like you're building cover. And I and, and again, I'm talking to you real talk because I don't want to whitewash and pretend that people don't feel real jeopardy around us. But ultimately, the core of the question is what's important. We have to teach it because if we don't, what we're doing is leaving our students in a way that and I didn't again apologize and get to share all these examples with you. But I could have talked about Dolores Huerta. She was one of my examples. Um, Paul Lee Murray was one of my examples, Malcolm X and of course, Melba Patilla Beals. All of these great activists who we celebrate all had these moments. John Lewis had these moments in education where they said, how come no one ever said or taught me this and I had to learn it outside the context? So we're just creating opportunity and spaces for us to do that, but to do that with cover so that, you know, again, my goal isn't for you to make the six o'clock news. My goal is to help you empower your students to question the six o'clock news and for them to make the six o'clock news 10 years from now and reimagining what we've all been dealing with and experiencing um, this year. When, when you mentioned the John Lewis quote, uh, you made me think about um, 
Juneteenth. There are lots of people saying, why did I never learn about Juneteenth? And as we know, that just became a national holiday. There is a great point, Dr. Uh, um, uh, uh, Sarhana, great point, sorry. Um, the, the person who asked the previous question just also elaborated and said, our students see the events, they are watching and their voices need to be heard. How do we combat restrictions or censorship? I think that you spoke to that unless you wanna add anything else, but I just wanted you to know that, you know, this person is saying they see this and that's very true. They saw what happened at the Capitol, they see this. I'm gonna just gonna respond to that very quickly. And I, whoever that is, if you wanna write me offline, I mean, I'd love to talk to you more about this, but look, um, Stephen and uh, Nitsa did it with you earlier, and Melba's mom made, um, actually asked her to do it. And I love that Melba credits her mom for this. Her mom said, keep a journal because, honey, you're living through history. and One day you're going to want to look back on this. And that became the basis for Warriors Don't Cry. So we have this incredible resource on what she was experiencing in that moment in 1957-58 because her mom said, keep a journal. I, I love asking students to journal. Uh, again, something I also saw at your school, Principal Smith, the idea that you are encouraging young people to, um, to write with a purpose. It's not just the essay for the sake of the essay. Now, I'm gonna look at your grammar, grammar and everything else. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna correct that, but I'm gonna give you a purpose to write about that allows you to also process your feelings about this moment. And again, that's one of those exercises that um, if, if the critics come, a journal is personal. It's not what you ask students to write about, it's what they chose to write about, but you creating the space for them to be able to share to reflect, and that's important. Thank you. Here's another. Do you have any strategies for how we respond to the inaccurate CRT narrative that is filling our BOE meetings? I agree with the democratic values, critical thinking, and culturally sustaining teaching. However, the other side seems so far away in their beliefs. At times, it feels hopeless. Uh and we combat that hopelessness. The one thing that I wanted to share with you that I, I wasn't able to was uh, from John Lewis's letter where he wrote, ordinary people make history both individually and collectively. Um, the struggles of the past are not new. They continue to echo in our contemporary moment. And that's this is the good trouble, necessary trouble he was talking about. Um, for those of you that don't know, I, I got to know John Lewis uh, fairly well. And one thing that I always appreciated about him is that his argument was never about how you answer your critics. It was about being strong in your conviction that the way that you answer them is by demonstrating on a consistent basis, the relevancy of your point of view. The relevancy of critical race theory is that A, we don't teach critical race theory. We teach culturally responsive teaching practices. What are the demographics of the, the, the district in which I teach? Um, you know, Why am I advocating for um, music and arts education? because we know those are universal languages and like mathematics, they give me the best chance to reach those students, those English language learners, um, students with social emotional problems um, in a way that allow them to excel, to build self-esteem, so on and so forth. In those BOE meetings, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in this. Um, the real conversation is to be had with the members of the Board of Education, but I'm not for wasting your energy or your time trying to answer people who've never read any of the books that um, they're complaining about, nor am I for wasting your energy or time with people cherry picking um, your um, assignments and things like that. Again, I think if it's a strategy and particularly if you can get your colleagues to talk about this, if you as a department, and I've done work with uh, public schools in, in um, Connecticut around this, the department adopts a statement. This is what we're teaching. This is what critical thinking means. This means you're gonna be exposed to this. Put, put your ducks in or make sure you have your trigger warners, warnings in, but also be very clear that in this moment, in this age of mass disruption, our students are watching and you don't have the luxury, right? They're not talking about it at home. We know they're gonna be talking about it at school. So you're creating the pathway for them to do that. But again, your coverage is always gonna be rooted in uh, two things. I wanna make sure I put to bed what you originally asked. Um, I'm not concerned about what's happening at the Board of Education meetings and I'll tell you why because those people ultimately expose themselves. In those places where they have the numbers, they're gonna push that through and they're gonna prevail. In the spaces where they don't have the numbers, we then have to think about what we're creating within our schools themselves, within our classrooms, that it's very clear that we're communicating to our um, supervisors, to the board of education, to, um, you know, this is why I'm doing this, this is why it's relevant. And, and those are gonna be more rational people, hopefully. And if they're not, um, you know, 
we've also seen, and, and that's happened in some places, then we have to be more creative. And I talked about some of those strategies earlier. Thank you, this is, this is great information. Here's a last question that came through the Q&A. Do you have an online course parents can take to learn this stuff you are discussing? And so perhaps even to take it further, do you have any book recommendations? Are there, I mean, I know a lot of folks are looking at YouTube videos to try to gain knowledge these days. Uh, what are your suggestions for people who want to learn more about what you discussed today? Um, you know, I think it's such a great question. Um, and somebody had a, let me see here. So I, you know, I, this is a kind of an interesting comment and in the thing that I'm gonna talk about. This is, this is part of the problem is that we're supposed to promote open-mindedness, right? So the most important thing for me is thinking about how I can share accessible materials with my students. That opens up a range of other resources that we typically don't use um, in classroom, right? Documentaries, short videos, um, diaries, uh, literature, uh, like Ghost Boys. I mean, there's so many great things that you can utilize today to kind of deepen that conversation in a way. And what I don't do, and what I think the danger is in this moment is that people come with kind of their canned political analysis of whatever you say and they go, oh, well, you know, you're being this and you're being that and you're being the other thing. Look, if I ask my students to watch a documentary like The Jim Crow of the North, which is the history of redlining in this country, right, which is on Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then I ask the simple question, has this been the reality in Connecticut? And they go and look at Milford, Connecticut, and the history of redlining in Milford or in Bridgeport or New Haven. That's critical thinking. That's research, so on and so forth. If the question then is, well, you're leading them to that conclusion, why are you asking that question? Because there's a national conversation right now around this. Because this is also not only a conversation about history, it's a conversation about um, civics, and it's also a conversation about um, economics. How is that a conversation about economics? Well, ultimately, I'm going to be talking about uh, home loans, financial systems, economic practices, and how those are influenced by history. That's a huge lesson. And if they can be interdisciplinary lessons, if you can share the work across um, uh, disciplines, you put yourself in an even better position to say, this is something our school has taken on. This is something that we've taken on. Not because we're out to, and again, I caution people about the use of, don't invite the critics to pick you off because you use the language. Um, I don't have to use white supremacy in order for people to understand that what I'm talking about is white supremacy. I tend to shy away from those, those labels anyway, because it's just the, it's the cheap shot that somebody gets to walk by and go, oh, see, this is the problem. No, the problem is that you haven't done the work and you're not prepared um, in any way to do those things that we associate with critical thinking, looking at multiple perspectives, looking at different perspectives that would em enable you to understand where we're coming from when we say, this is what our young people are experiencing. This is what they're asking for. And this is why they leave so unfulfilled from K-12 education. They don't see anything beyond that. Because in their, their eyes, what did I learn here that was relevant to me? Very little. And again, for people to read that as an assault on American democracy, it's actually the opposite of that. And I'll conclude by saying this, and I kind of began here and talking about the Confederate monuments. Uh, the reality is that if we can look at um, our contemporary moment as a microcosm of some of the enduring challenges we've had around um, discourse in this country over politics, it's in an even more powerful way for us to get young people to think about how they can make a difference. Because what it signals to them is that none of this is written in stone. They have tremendous power in this moment if they don't give up, if they stick to the books, if they continue to read, if they continue to study, if they continue to interrogate, they continue to have, they're going to be the future and that's meaningful to, for, to them because they can look back to 1963 and go, it might be really bad now, but you know, George Wallace was George Wallace and this person is this person and when I get my shot, it's going to be a very different world. Cardona talked to that to a certain extent today. And yet at the same time, I don't want young people to think that everybody's a hero. We're all complicated. Um, there are no heroes. There are complicated people who make difficult decisions. But the arc of the universe bends toward justice and are those who help to bend it toward justice that we celebrate, that we honor. And that's really where we want to focus our attention.
I hope that everyone agrees with me that this was such a treat to have you here with us this morning. I cannot thank you enough. And on behalf of Cass, I know that we're all very proud to have had you here to share uh, in this work with us. Um, I know that you have a huge presence on Twitter. So for everyone out there who is interested in following Dr. Williams, um, connecting with him, please link up with him on Twitter. He's He tweets almost daily, I think, multiple times a day, I think. <laughs> Thank you again, Dr. Williams. Thank you.